So Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 9, going to verse 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet, saying, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see who the, whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like fiery flame. His feasts were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of the cascading waters. He had the seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was shining like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands are this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. As we come now to have a think about that odd passage, please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you'll give us the ears to hear, the hearts to understand, and the wills to put into practice what you would have us learn from it today. Amen. So have you ever met anyone in your life that you severely underestimated? Back in 2007, a violinist named Joshua Bell decided to go busking. Now, Joshua is one of the greatest violinists around. He's the musical director of a top-notch musical ensemble, the Academy of St. Martin's in the Field, to be exact. Normally, tickets to his concerts sell for hundreds of dollars each, and he can sell them out. His violin alone is worth $14 million, apparently. So in his time busking at an American railway station, he made a grand total of $57 for four hours' work. Why did he make so little, given he's so good? Well, it's partly because not many people listen to violin music, but it's mostly because people underestimated who he was and misjudged the type of music that he was playing. He was probably playing one of the most expensive violins in the best way possible, and everyone just assumed, oh, he's just another busker. Well, unfortunately, this is often what happens with Jesus. When we come to Jesus, we hear about the Christmas story, we hear about his birth in Bethlehem, we remember the child in the manger, and we stop there, and we forget what comes next. Because the amazing thing is that the passage I just read from Revelation chapter 1, that was Jesus in that picture. It may not look like it, but that picture we read from Revelation and the Jesus, the baby in the manger, are the same person. And what we have to learn today is what this picture means and what John is trying to tell us about Jesus as we unpack this rather strange vision. You see, John was exiled to a prison island called Patmos. He was there because he was arrested for preaching the gospel. And at the time, people didn't like Christianity. Most of the citizens of the nations thought that the church was bad for society. The empire thought that Christians were a really good scapegoat for everything that was going wrong. And so John gets a vision from God to strengthen the church during a time of tough persecution. 
And then he gets this vision. He sees a person with flaming eyes, a sword coming out of his mouth, white hair, lampstand, stars. What's going on? Doesn't really sound like a person, does it? Well, the book of Revelation likes to talk in pictures. And the key to figuring out what's going on is to try and understand the pictures. Imagine this. What if I came up to you and said that I had a dream? In this dream, I saw 11 green and gold kangaroos with boxing gloves. They were standing on a cricket pitch. Suddenly, 11 white lions came onto the pitch too. They had a bit of a tussle, but the kangaroos easily threw the lions back into the dressing rooms. Now, you guys get what that picture means. If any of you are cricket fans, you've worked out, I'm talking about the Boxing Day test. Green and gold kangaroos with boxing gloves, that's Australia. White lions, that's England. And clearly, we're going to win. Well, this is what John is doing in the book of Revelation. He gives us a series of pictures that help explain what's going on. So the first thing that John sees, he says he sees one like a son of man standing with some lampstands. Now, the title, the son of man, is one used by the books of the Old Testament, one called Daniel in particular. And the son of man was a title given to God's chosen king, the one who would rule his people forever. It's also one of Jesus' favorite terms for himself. If you read the Gospels, often when Jesus is talking about himself, he will call himself the Son of Man. And so the first thing John wants us to know is that this picture that he's got, this person who he's seeing, it's Jesus. God has given him a vision of Jesus in all his resurrected glory. And in case this wasn't quite clear yet, in verse 18, he says something even more telling. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever. Clearly, Jesus wants us to know this is me. This is Jesus who we're talking about. And the first thing John notes is what he's wearing. He's wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. What's going on there? Often the robe is described as reaching down to his feet. This means that he's powerful. Only powerful people wore long robes. Why do powerful people wear long robes? Because you don't have to do any hard work. You can't do any yard work in a long robe. It gets in the way. Imagine trying to plow a field or fix a fence wearing an evening gown. It just doesn't work. So if you've got enough power to wear a long robe, it means you're powerful enough to have people to do all your hard work for you. The gold sash means that he's a priest. He's a priest of God in the temple. And this is why the lampstands are there too. One of the jobs of the priests was to tend the lights in the temple. And there he is, tending the lights. We find out later that these lamps are the churches scattered throughout the world. So first up, we see that John sees Jesus. And Jesus is in the temple of God, tending and maintaining his church. Next thing we see is his hair, funnily enough. We hear that his hair is white like wool. Why is that an important detail? Well, firstly, it shows his wisdom and age and insight, but then it also points to something more. Because throughout the Old Testament, whenever a prophet would have a vision of God, God would be, have hair that's white like wool and would speak in a voice like a trumpet. Daniel chapter 7 puts it like this. The Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow and the hair of his head like white as wool. Then later on in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel in his vision says, I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice sounded like the roar of mighty waters and the earth shone with his glory. And so here, John gets a vision and Jesus has a voice like a trumpet like the cascading waters, and hair that is white like wool. This Jesus is not just a man, he is God himself. 
and comes with the power and authority of the God who created the universe. This is also why John gets told that his face is shining like the sun at its brightest. That's a picture of the holiness of God shining out and radiating from Jesus. In this vision that John saw, John wants to make it particularly clear, Jesus is God. No ifs, buts, or maybes. We often like to write off Jesus as just a nice guy who had some kind of nice things to say about love. But we can't leave it at that because Jesus is more than just a wise teacher. He comes with the authority of God himself. And that just means we can't just take the bits we like about him and ignore the bits we don't. We have to take him for who he is and what he says, whether we like it or not. And the final image we get is the large two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. This is because he is the judge, and he will judge the world by his word. How we respond to God's word given to us in Jesus will determine how that judgment comes about. This is what the sword is there for. How does this picture fit with your picture of Jesus? We really like baby Jesus in the manger. He's innocent, sweet. He doesn't ask me to change anything about my life. But the Bible makes it clear that baby Jesus lying in the manger and this kingly priest with flaming eyes and a giant sword are the same person. The baby in the manger is God himself come to earth to be with us. The great teacher who we see walking through the pages of the Gospels is God himself, not giving nice suggestions by giving serious commands that need to be considered. Then in verse 18, Jesus starts talking, and he starts talking about himself. He says, He is the one who lives forever, and he has the keys to death and Hades. Because of his resurrection that we learn about during the Easter period, it means that Jesus will never die again. He died once, was brought back to life by God and now lives forever and now has the power to grant that life to anyone who follows him. What's with the keys? Well, when you lock a door, the only person who can come in and out is someone with a key. If you've got keys to a place, you can come and go as you please. This is why it's such a big deal when your parents give you your first set of house keys means you can come and go without needing to call them up or get them out of bed. Well, Jesus has the keys to Hades. Hades is just the place where dead people go. Jesus now has the power to unlock the place of the dead and give life to anyone who follows him. But why does he get this power? What gives him the right to choose who lives forever and who doesn't? Well, that's because of what he came to do. You see, ultimately, death is a punishment. It's our punishment for ignoring God and trying to be God in his place. The Bible's word for this is sin. But Jesus, when he lived here on earth, lived a perfect life, never tried to usurp the rule of God in his life. And that means he didn't deserve the death that he died. And so... God brought him back from the dead. He now offers to let his death stand in the place of our own. He has taken the punishment our treason deserved and now can extend that life to anyone who trusts him. Because Jesus is the baby lying in the manger, because he is human, he can stand in our place and take the punishment we deserve. Because he is God, He can stand and offer forgiveness for the wrongs done to God. This is why he holds the keys to death and Hades. He's the one who took our punishment. He's the one who took what we deserved and he's the one who can offer mercy. And so when we trust him, he extends the life that he has been given to anyone who is willing to follow. 
The last picture that John gives us is an explanation of the stars and the lampstands. The lampstands represent the churches scattered throughout the world, and Jesus stands at the centre of the church. He also holds in his hands the angels of the church. The angels here probably represent the kind of individuals gathered in the church, because later on, as we read the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches are addressed to the angel of the church of Ephesus, say. But the letter is meant for the congregation, the people there. And so God holds in his hand the churches and the people in them. He tends the lampstand so that they will not go out. Persecution and corruption in the church will never extinguish it. God is looking after it. When we gather here as a church, we're not just gathering here in Narrabri, but we have a presence in the holy temple of God in heaven itself, and God himself walks among us. But this doesn't come without a warning. Later on in the book of Revelation, Jesus says in his letter to the Ephesian church, he says, Remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Jesus is the head of the church, and that means he has the authority to remove the church from his presence. John speaks specifically of seven lampstands and seven stars because he's writing to seven specific churches, but they stand as representatives for the church scattered throughout the world. But if we lose focus on Christ as our head, if we abandon Jesus, then we are no longer a church and the lampstand will be removed. Who do you say that Jesus is? Does your idea of Jesus match up with this picture in the book of Revelation? Or are you stuck thinking of only Jesus as being a baby in a manger? Christmas is a great time to recalibrate the idea of Jesus that you have in your head. He's the God of the universe. He has come to share our humanity so that we might live forever with him when he comes to create the new heavens and the new earth. If we leave Jesus stuck in the manger, then we lose many of his benefits because it's only the grown and resurrected Jesus who comes as the perfect judge who will bring true and perfect justice to the world. It is only the Jesus of Revelation who has experienced suffering, who knows what we're going through in our deepest moments and can offer comfort when we need it. It is only the Jesus of Revelation who offers to save us from our sins, to allow us to live forever and never die. He is God's chosen king, chosen to rule over his church. And one day when he returns, he will come and put an end to death and suffering in this world. Is this the Jesus you think of when you hear the name Jesus? Jesus looks after his people, gives them purpose and meaning, and offers his resurrected life to anyone who will trust in him. So now is the time, this Christmas, to see Jesus for who he really is, to recalibrate what we think of him, and to take seriously the offer that he extends to everyone, to trust in him and have eternal life.